Let's get right to it. First first half of the season, uh, the Big 12 season is behind you. Uh, what is your initial impression of going through nine games of this league? Oh, it's it's the best league in America. Um, you know, you, you, you hear that, you, you do your research and your preparation, and you certainly believe that, but experiencing it is something different. Um, it's every night, it's every possession. Every team has uh, great players. Every team is well coached. And again, saying it's one thing, experiencing it's something different, and we're, we're still only halfway through. So uh, as I've said all along, uh, I believe that being in this league, uh, having to rise to the occasion every night in this league, it's awesome. It's going to improve our program. It's going to improve this team. I believe that more emphatically now than I even did when I said it, and I believed it when I said it going into it. John's obviously having a great season, and it's really translated into the Big 12 from the AAC. When you look at a guy like that and how he's developed, does it kind of show, even during this time of like roster flexibility and all the movement, that he's that type of player that he is just so hard to find and replace or identify? Yeah, I'm proud of John. Um, you know, and it's – not going to do a ton of reflecting because we still got a lot of basketball left to play and he's got to kind of stay at it but uh what's what's neat is that you know in the era that we're in where there's so much movement and transferring and all that the guys that stay with it and stay with you you know it, it's it's even more special because you don't get that as much anymore and so John the, just the the player coach relationship is special to me because we've been through it together. Um, we've been through a lot of stuff together over the last three years, and, you know, that is, in a lot of ways, what you got into coaching for, a lot of us. And so it still exists out there. It, it might, might be more rare, but it still exists. So um, I'm proud of what he's done to this point. We still have a lot of basketball left to play, and he's got to kind of continue to keep doing his part every day. Houston plays tonight. You got them Saturday. How do you mimic what they do on defense? Do, do, do you play like eight on five or what? <laughs> um, you, you can't mimic it. Uh, if if you could mimic what Houston does on defense, other people would be doing it in games. You know, there's a reason they're the best defensive team in college basketball. Um, they have been. They continue to be. And uh, num Number one, having I've gone against them six times over the last two years, so I've seen it up close and personal. Um, you can't simulate it in practice, but you got to try to do a good job uh, of figuring out a good game plan and how to how to execute against a, a, a unique style for sure. With all of the uh, with your losses in the Big 12 this year being as close as they have been, looking like a possession here or there could be the difference. What is the biggest difference that you've noticed in Big 12 basketball between that close loss and a win? Yeah, I don't know if you can single out one thing, but as you look around, not just our games, but the league, so many games come down to one or two possessions. So t to me, it's what are you doing every day as a team to try to get one possession better in the areas you can control, you know? Um, and as you go back and you review all these tapes or you coach these games, you know, the teams that control what they can control to win one or two or three extra possessions, that's the difference in games. And there's been nights that you know, you look down and we, we did a nice job of trying to do that. And then there's nights that you don't and you're just going, man, if we just did a little better job, we win one or two more possessions. I think it's, you know, the obvious stuff is, is always going to be there. Did you shoot it good? Did you make your free throws? Did you make your, I mean, that, of, of course that stuff's a factor, but, you know, to me, you can't always control that, but you can control execution. You can control your defensive assignments. You can control sprinting back on defense. You can control communication. You can control your rebounding effort and assignments. You know, the stuff you can control, are you getting better and better, and do you have an attention to detail and a focus there? And then is your effort where it needs to be? You know, I, I think that that's the difference in a lot of these games uh, in, be, beyond the surface-level stuff that everybody's aware of. I know you're not one to reflect, but CMOS had a very strong game on the road. Um, how important was it to see CMOS have a strong game on the road and just what does he mean to this team? Yeah, you know, CMOS, as we've said since before anybody here saw him in a 
Cincinnati uniform. is a terrific player. He's really important to this team, whether it's with the ball in his hands or, or not with the ball in his hands. Uh, and he went through a tough fall with the injuries and hitting the car and all that. And I think uh, conference play, we've relied on him heavily. He's had some nights. I know he wanted a couple shots back or a couple plays back, but he just continues to stay confident. Uh, he continues to make plays. And, you know, I think one thing I've known is if he'll just stay with it, which he has, he's going to have a lot of good good moments here. And people are starting to see that now. But when you recruit somebody like Dede Thomas, you envision, I'm sure, a guy like that could be a high-level defender. Has he maybe even been better than you expected defending the ball, icing ball, like getting over screens, you know, kind of all the little things that he's done for you? Well, I, I, what I will say is I, I think with a lot of these guys, and, and when, you rec when you recruit somebody, at least, at least here with us, like you have a high level of belief of what they're capable of or you shouldn't bring them into your program. So I don't, I don't sit there and watch the things that Day Day's doing defensively and say that I'm surprised. Uh, I certainly envisioned that. Uh, but I, I do think it's, it's, it's nice that somebody's recognizing his defensive improvement, um, how quickly he's figured that out coming from junior college and recognizing him for it. So I'm not surprised. I, I actually think he can continue to get better and better there. Uh, but he has become a reliable defensive player. He's picked up this level of of defense, not just the speed and the talent, but the ability to communicate, the ability to be in the right position, which a lot of first-year players at this level struggle with, whether it's freshman or junior college, even somebody transferring up to this level. He's done that uh, – in a nice way, and I think it's important to recognize that doesn't surprise me. It is an expectation. Um, I also think give him credit because he's come in with a, the right mentality every day, and I think that's why he's having some defensive success. And then give his, his junior college coach a lot of credit. I mean, he, played for, he played for a great junior college coach, uh, a guy named Coach Hobright. Uh, and, and so he probably – he probably came in a little more ready than, than some others because of who he played for. You talked about Houston kind of being the standard for phys physicality and toughness. In all your meetings with Kelvin Sampson, what have you kind of seen him do consistently to get the best out of his guys game in and game out? In my meetings? Like in your game oh, in the games them. that we've yeah. played. Yeah, I, I think you're always trying to to learn. You know, like we're always trying to get our guys to learn and grow and you know, you're trying to do the same thing as a coach, and you know I've learned, I've learned a lot uh, preparing and, and competing against uh, Kelvin Sampson's Houston teams. You know, there's 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 certain aspects to the way that they play that you know you resonate with. You know, you want to do it your own genuine way that fits who you are as a coach and the institution you're at and the players you have, but just the the mentality to rebound and defend and give relentless effort every possession you know i i resonate with that and you know i i want us to get to a, a place uh with this program where people talk about us doing that at the highest possible standard um people you know nationally talk about houston right now in that way and i want us to get to a point where we're doing that in, in our own cincinnati way uh but we got a lot of work to do there uh, but you, you certainly learned a little bit about it, you know, kind of coaching and uh, competing against them. And there's a, I have a, a high level of respect for how they go about their business. Jamil Reynolds only averaging about 12 minutes per game so far this season. Is that just a matter of there's not a lot of spots, not a ton of extra playing time for him to get in the front court, or is there something he has to do or improve to get more minutes in this front court rotation? Well, I'll, I'll tell you how he's played the last two games is him doing his part. You know, I, I thought the last two games we've seen the Jameel Reynolds that, you know, I think that we envisioned seeing. And I think that he knows he, he played to the level he's capable of playing on both ends of the floor. And it's felt consistent over the last two games. So I think that that's the thing with Jameel. Number one, we got to put it in perspective. It's really hard to, to insert into a team nine games in, um, you know, where the majority of our, our players – 
we had a chance to work through some things with them in the first in, uh, through the month of November and December. Not that those aren't important games, but it's a little different than league games. Um, so maybe you can work through some mistakes and some errors in those preseason games, which is important for your team development. Jamil didn't get that opportunity. We didn't get that opportunity as a team or as a coaching staff to do that. So we're trying to do that for the most part with Jamil through, you know, I think our first six league games were against six top 25 opponents. That's that's very difficult for for us as a coaching staff and also for Jamil. It's not an excuse. It's just it's the truth of what it is. Um, so he's, over the last month, five, six weeks, been going through the process that the rest of our team went through over the month of November, or really late October with the scrimmages through the month of November. Um, and now you're starting to see not just consistent play, but we've seen a more consistent approach and intention in practice. So I, I, I think the world of him, I think he can really impact winning on this team. He can have a massive role on this team. And I do think we're trending in the right direction there. You get a lot of questions about uh, CJ. Is it unrealistic to expect a whole lot out of him when he comes back, given he has to get his basketball legs and all that together? Yeah, I think anytime somebody's uh, been out for an extended period of time with an injury, you know, it's unfair to have too high expectations for their performance. I think the, the main thing with CJ is trying to get him back into live play and practice, you know, getting putting consistent days together, and then getting to a place we can play him in games. And so. We're just kind of taking it one step at a time. I, you know, I, I don't have some illusion that CJ plays in his first game and has the best game of his college career. But I will tell you that CJ just being out on the court will impact our team in a positive way, and we'll un we understand it's a process. But just having his presence out there and his experience and the things that he brings to a basketball team, that's going to help us regardless of how good or bad he plays. Uh, but you know, everybody's going to have some adjustment coming off of a long break. The season is long, and, and guys go through the roller coaster of, of ups and downs. Vic offensively is at least in a little bit of a a valley right now. How do you continue to work with him and get his confidence back and to get back to that top of that hill? And I, I, won't, I won't say funk. <laughs> Appreciate you choosing your words carefully. I, no, Vic hasn't had his best stretch. I think he's well aware of that. I actually, you know, for me it's – it's a boring answer for you guys, you know, trying to, to write and get get interesting stories, but it's the truth. I mean, you, you work your way out of things. You know, you, you dig in, you get back to the fundamentals, you work your tail off, you play hard, uh, you, you play to, for the right reasons for your team, and, and then I think good things follow you. They might not follow you exactly in the, the way and time that we all want, but they, they happen, and... Vic knows that. Uh, I thought he got back to that at the end of last week, and I certainly thought he got back to that in our last Texas Tech game. He won our Hustle and Effort Award, and we graded the film. Uh, I, I thought it was the, the best effort I'd seen him play with in a really long time. And to me, that's step one. And we all know how important he is. He's one of the most important players to this team. Uh, and it's not just about does he miss or make shots. It's about all the little stuff that he brings to a team and the winning stuff that he does. And I, I think he's trending in the right direction there over the last three or four days. Thanks, guys.